students a hearty welcome to another lecture of the video lecture series brought out by our department on readings on democracy and secularism uh, prescribed for the third semester English common course of Kannur University. Today I'll be talking about the sixth lesson of your textbook Discoursing Diversities titled The Indian Constitution Limited but Necessary which is written by the Vice Chancellor of our University Professor Gopinath Ravindra. I'm not planning to give a line by line or even a paragraph by paragraph explanation of the lesson. Rather I'll be discussing the central ideas that Professor Gopinath Ravindran is trying to communicate through this essay which he has written uh, for this uh, textbook and also I'll be giving you some inputs regarding Indian history which will uh, help you understand the lesson better. So before we move on to a discussion of the lesson proper let's have a very quick look at the uh, profile of the writer uh, Professor Gopinath Ravindra. You know he as you know is a professor of history uh, and uh, he had his uh, research degree the doctoral degree from the reputed Jawaharlal Nehru University New Delhi after which he had a short stint uh, in teaching career at uh, St. Stephen's College, Delhi and later he uh, joined the reputed Jamia Millia Islamia University, Delhi where he continued for a long period. In the meanwhile he did a postdoctoral research also in the world renowned London School of Economics and uh, he has held a coveted administrative post also. He was the member secretary of the ICHR Indian Council of Historical Research and he has uh, joined our university as the vice chancellor and has been leading the university for the last three to three and a half years and uh, academically you know he has a number of uh, publications to his credit and the, the main book which he has brought out which is in his uh, doctoral research area is historical demography and agrarian regimes and another significant article uh, worth mentioning is uh, the, the one that he wrote about William Logan uh, which uh, is uh, published in the new edition of Logan's Malabar Manual. So with that brief introduction about the author, about the writer of this article, uh, let us move on to uh, the essay, the article. The Indian Constitution Limited but Necessary. You see the title itself speaks uh, about the spirit of the article. You know he says that the Indian Constitution is necessary because Constitution is a foundational principle as far as uh, any democracy is concerned, any uh, you know polity or a ruling system is concerned. And uh, in a democratic setup you know, constitution has great value, it is the cornerstone upon which uh, democracy is built. And he begins that uh, essay by uh, highlighting the significance of uh, a constitution as far as a democracy is uh, concerned. And another uh, word that you will, key word that you will find in the title is limited. So he says that uh, in the, throughout the essay, this is the argument, he says that you know, uh, the uh, constitution has uh, helped us, it has uh, been foundational in uh, you know, forming an India, in taking India to the present heights uh, in many respects but at the same time the constitution has been limited as far as the redistributive justice to uh, the, the hapless people, the millions of uh, people living in poverty and uh, uh, you know, facing different kinds of discrimination are concerned. Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, you know, he begins uh, by stating that the constitution serves as the legal foundation of the nation 
and how the constitution set forth the objectives and values of the state and the relationship between the different elements of the state uh, including people and uh, uh, th so this actually highlights uh, the, the importance the significance of the constitution in addition to that uh, in the essay uh, he will be analyzing the strengths of the constitution and the and the limitations as uh, you know already hinted it and uh, he will uh, also speak about or he also speaks about uh, the need to uphold the spirit of the constitution to guarantee uh, decent living conditions for all sections of people all segments of people irrespective of any barrier be it economic political communal territorial whatever it is and uh, after speaking about the the relevance of the constitution as far as a democratic country like uh, india is concerned he speaks about the specialities of our constitution three main points are highlighted there one you know indian constitution uh, is a constitution that has been drafted over a period of three years by a constituent assembly you have already studied this in the first lesson uh, in ambedkar's concluding uh, speech in the constituent assembly a constituent assembly was uh, formed in uh, 1946 uh, 1946 december 6th and it met on december 9th for the first time and from that uh, another committee uh, a seven member committee headed by uh, dr b r ambedkar was uh, formed uh, to draft the constitution and the committee had a series of sittings and uh, it is it is discussed in detail in the in the first lesson that i mentioned and uh, uh, you know with three years uh, concerted efforts uh, they gave us this constitution about which we can really feel proud of so the first point is it's a constitution which has been uh, uh, drafted or which uh, we, uh, a constitution uh, which took 3 years for the drafting second point is you know it is uh, the longest written constitution in the world it has about 1.5 Four five lakhs words. It had at that time twenty six parts, three ninety five articles and eight schedules. Now we have twenty five parts, four forty eight articles and twelve schedules. That's the second point. Uh, the volume of the constitution. The third point is, it invokes the people of India as the source of the constitution, unmediated by. Any god or religion in, in the constitution of most of the countries you will find that the constitution is given by god but uh, if you uh, you know look at the preamble of the constitution you, know, you you find it on the screen now the preamble just just go to the first two lines and the last two lines uh, I, I need only those lines to prove this particular point you know see we the people of india having solemnly resolved to constitute India into a sovereign socialist secular democratic republic okay, it goes on like that so it begins with we the people of India then come to the last line last but uh, last but one line see um, in our constituent assembly on this 26th day of November 49 do hereby adopt enact and give to ourselves this constitution so we the people of India give this constitution to ourselves so there is no intermediary uh, as far as uh, the uh, the constitution is concerned next he speaks about the the constitution of the constituent assembly uh, as already mentioned you know it was uh, formed in 1946 and about the membership uh, the statistics is given there there was uh, there were 389 members of which 292 represented the provincial legislatures you know they were the representatives of the provincial legislatures which came into being in uh, 1946 
Then 93 were the representatives of the princely states and four members were the representatives of the chief commissioner territories uh, like you know Delhi, Kurk, British, Balochistan and so on. Okay. Then after 1947 you know when uh, India got bifurcated into India and Pakistan uh, a section of the members left and uh, after that, after June 1947, uh, the Constituent Assembly had only 299 members. Then he speaks about the strength of the Constitution. You know, the, uh, our Constitution uh, has the potential to anticipate the changes that are needed in future also. So we have provisions for amendment, but uh, you know, these uh, amendments cannot be made very easily. Uh, for for this amendments uh, there are rigorous procedures you know some amendments can be passed with a simple majority in the parliament uh, for some amendments uh, a special majority is needed in both houses of the parliament and for some other amendments a special majority in both the houses plus a special majority in a particular number of uh, you know assemblies state assemblies are also required so uh, we cannot very easily alter the constitution, amend the constitution. And in that context, he speaks about the Keshavananda Bharati case. The name Keshavananda Bharati may be familiar to you because uh, he passed away a few months back and uh, he is from our place, you know, actually from Kasaragod. Uh, he was the chief of the Edanir Mutt. Uh, and he filed a case in the Supreme Court against the uh, land reforms bill of the government of Kerala when there was an uh, attempt to annex uh, the territory belonging to his institution, his religious institution, the mud. And in 1973, uh, uh, the 13 member constitution bench of the Supreme Court, the Honorable Supreme Court of India, uh, gave a judgment that the basic structure of the constitution cannot be amended by the parliament. It's a very historic judgment in the sense that uh, it upheld uh, the spirit of the constitution. It actually prevented a party with a, a lion share majority to make any amendment to the constitution as it wishes. So, uh, in the Keshavan and the Bharati case, uh, the basic structure of the constitution, like say the, the fundamental rights, for example, was upheld. So, this basic structure doctrine, you know, that has been a guiding light as far as uh, uh, the, uh, the Indians or as far as uh, the, the parliamentarians were concerned you know, ever since that judgment in uh, 1973. Another uh, amendment that he speaks about is the 42nd amendment which was uh, a very very massive kind of amendment because this amendment was a series of amendments actually you know uh, it effected changes in almost all sections of the constitution. It was for the first time uh, that the preamble of the constitution uh, was amended. Uh, you, you find you know both the uh, both the preambles on the screen now uh, you see uh, in the original one you will find uh, that india uh, is a, a sovereign uh, democratic republic whereas in the in the amended one after the 42nd amendment two uh, more words are added one is socialist and the other is secular initially sovereign and democratic were only but this uh, constitutional amendment, I mean the 42nd amendment uh, became very controversial because it uh, gave the prime minister and the parliament powers even beyond judicial review. Uh, you know, the amendments uh, were in the line of making the parliament as well as the executive stronger and the judiciary weaker. And you should understand the context of this amendment also. You know, it was passed in uh, 1976 when 
the internal emergency was operational in India. As you know, the uh, Indira Gandhi government uh, declared internal emergency in 1975 and it continued up to 1977. Anyway, uh, uh, after that, after the emergency, uh, you know, the, the Janata Party government that came into power, uh, they repealed uh, most of the uh, 42nd Amendment, the controversial provisions of the 42nd Amendment through subsequent amendments, that is uh, Amendment 40, uh, 43rd and 44th, which uh, came in 77 and 78. Then uh, the essay uh, says that our constitution so far has been able to withstand the pressures uh, even when uh, there were huge majority of seats for one party for the ruling party and actually this basic structure doctrine or the basic structure judgment in the Keshavan, Keshavan of the Bharati case you know that helped or that came for the rescue of the constitution. Uh, in the next few paragraphs Professor uh, Gopinath Ravindran speaks about the context of the drafting of the constitution. You know, um, we had a long uh, uh, freedom struggle, uh, you know, about 200, for about 200 years we fought against the British in organized and unorganized ways and uh, for about 100 years, uh, uh, maybe with varying enthusiasm, uh, we, we fought against uh, the, the imperial force of the British imperial uh, forces. And, uh, you know, there were different sections of the, uh, of the Indian society who took, who took different positions with respect to the nationalist movements. You know, the members of the ancient regimes, maybe the, the princely states and all, you know, they, some of them were easily defeated by the British and they took sides with the British. The feudal lords often took sides with the British. And there were uh, a section... Uh, of religious nationalists who also directly and indirectly supported British imperialism. You know, they were uh, arguing for, fighting for uh, countries based on uh, religion, like, uh, you know, the Hindu, Hindu country or a Muslim country, maybe the Hindu Mahasapha or the Muslim League and similar organizations. And, uh, and Gopinath Ravindran says that uh, the long drawn struggle of Indian independence was chiefly led by the liberals and the, and the leftists. Uh, so they, they carried the, the Congress party at a later point it said the Congress party and the, even the Congress Socialist party, the, the early form of the left party, uh, they uh, you know, carried this uh, struggle uh, zealously forward. But uh, you know, even though uh, India got independence, um, there was no structural change uh, and that is the reason why most of the Indians or at least you know, many of the Indians are uh, living in abject poverty even now. There was no social distribution or even a, redis or a redistribution of wealth and property. So, uh, you know, property and wealth uh, uh, got accumulated in the hands of many and the poor people remained uh, poor. And uh, another point that he discusses is that uh, the constitution is the legal embodiment of the values, aspirations and anxieties of our national leaders. You know, they have been, our nationalist leaders have been sacrificing their comforts, their life, their living and they have been dreaming of uh, an India, a united India, a free India where every Indian could uh, you know, stand tall, walk tall and meet his basic requirements uh, and dream of a, uh, of a brighter future. So when India got independence and when we were uh, framing the constitution, you know, uh, we, they had to, the nationalist leaders had to take everybody into confidence because for building a nation, you know, uh, you know, when India got independence, you know, India was a more than a half of the population were in poverty, they were illiterate. So it was a very huge task on uh, the nationalist leaders and our rulers, administrators to take India into progress. 
for which the support of every section of the community is needed. So the capitalists, the interests of the capitalists had to be taken care of because they have the capital to uh, build different establishments. Uh, the interests of the property class uh, also had to be uh, you know, considered. Then uh, all sections uh, of uh, this diverse land, uh, their interests are, are also to be accommodated. Uh, economic backwardness was there, poverty was there, uh, caste-based, uh, uh, you know, discrimination was there. Uh, so, uh, very the situation was in a way very volatile also. Uh, but an outright revolutionary transformation uh, would not be fine. You know, that's what uh, the author feels. You know, a, a, a revolutionary transformation at that uh, point, you know, may do more harm uh, because we can uh, say uh, progress only through uh, democratic uh, values only by following democratic values then he goes back in history and speaks about our demands for democracy he says that you know it was there very uh, you know organized demands for democracy was there uh, from the early 20th century itself you know, uh, there was the Montego Chelmsford reforms in 1919 and uh, in 1927, uh, the Simon Commission was sent by the British uh, to, to review the situation in India. But uh, we Indians uh, boycotted the Simon Commission because that seven member uh, commission was an all white commission. It was, uh, the commission was sent to study about India to suggest measures for uh, you know, granting freedom to India or uh, to uh, to uh, negotiate uh, with the Indians regarding Indian independence and all, but uh, not even a single Indian was a member of that commission. All the seven were white, so uh, we boycotted the commission. And uh, instead of that, we uh, formed a commission, set up a commission headed by Motilal Nehru in 1928 to uh, determine the principles of our constitution. And in 1930s, you know, the civil disobedience movement uh, was uh, in full vigor and the Congress party uh, repeatedly put forth the demand for uh, a constitution for India, which is drafted by the Indians, not by the British. And in 1935, the Government of India Act uh, was passed. It's a very uh, crucial historical moment, 1935 Government of India Act, and that act uh, gave autonomy to the provinces, gave provincial autonomy. And in 19 uh, and provincial legislatures uh, uh, were formed. And in 1942, when the Second World War was on, uh, a mission was sent to India again by the British, the Crips mission. And uh, the Crips mission uh, agreed that Indian constitution would be ultimately drafted would be ultimately prepared by the Indians. Then uh, there was a, uh, the Second uh, World War, as you know, up to 1945. And in, uh, after the Second World War, uh, the Labour Party government under Clement Attlee, uh, you know, assumed charge in England, came to power in England. And in 1946, uh, the cabinet mission uh, plan, the cabinet mission that came to India, uh, which included Crips also, uh, Cripps, uh, uh, A.V. Alexander, Pethic Lawrence. So this uh, cabinet mission, they recommended uh, the uh, Constituent Assembly of India which came into being in uh, December 1946. Okay, that is uh, the, uh, about the, the, the history, the immediate history, that uh, historical events rather that, that led to the formation of the Constituent Assembly. The Nehru uh, says that the Constituent Assembly was a nation on the move. So it, it had to you know, understand the aspirations of the people. It had to understand the dreams and the needs of the, of the people. And here Gopnath Ravindran uh, says that uh, the basic structure doctrine uh, you know, it has ensured India as a sovereign, socialist, secular, democratic republic and a welfare state 
based on directive principles and on the on the federal a very strong federal system it has been successful in maintaining the unity and integrity of the country so it has been successful to that extent it is necessary and it has been successful to uh, that extent and he also uh, says that we have to give special care to safeguard the religious minorities and uh, you know, people from the uh, and uh, as well as the interests of the uh, the different territories because you know um, uh, there has been uh, uh, a series of communal rights in india uh, i need not tell you that you know you have that sense of history and uh, you know there was the partition of india so uh, communally religion wise you know we do not have a very uh, very very pleasant uh, history very grim it's a very grim history likewise you know uh, different uh, territories geographically culturally socially different territories were uh, you know merged into the indian union so they may be having their interest uh, like say for example kashmir even now that kashmir issue is continuing you know uh, so uh, we have to uh, uh, the sa says that we have to safeguard the interests of uh, such people and such sections uh, of india also and uh, he uh, again reiterates that uh, the political uh, the, the constitution has been successful in ensuring political democracy and uh, say secularism but uh, it could uh, perform only a limited uh, role in uh, redistributive justice bringing redistributive justice to millions of the the poor people uh, this point has uh, been discussed earlier uh, and it is reiterated here and uh, the writer quotes uh, uh, ambedkar uh, when he says that the parliamentary democracy in india developed a passion for liberty but unfortunately this passion for liberty swallowed up the commitment to equality see in the preamble it is uh, said that we will secure to uh, all the citizens justice liberty equality and fraternity so liberty the passion for liberty is there but liberty is given undue you know thrust and uh, equality social justice is not often followed in its true spirit it is there in the constitution the constitution envisages it but in reality in practice the situation is pathetic in many corners of the country and uh, we move towards the uh, last part of the essay the last two paragraphs uh, precisely uh, where he concludes by reiterating that uh, though the constitution could perform only a limited role in ensuring redistributive justice to millions of desperately poor indians it has still now protected our democratic rights and the secular fabric of the country that's very important you know when many countries that got independence uh, by the time india got independence uh, uh, actually slipped to tyranny slipped to military rule indian democracy is uh, standing strong even today there are many handicaps of course but still in a country like india where the population is very high uh, see maintaining democracy is a very very severe challenge and actually the credit of uh, the success of democracy should go to the constitution of india the well drafted constitution of india the constitution that lays the foundation for a democratic india the constitution which accommodates the changes uh, the socio political cultural changes that are likely to happen and which Uh, provides room for amendments uh, but at the same time uh, not amending the, uh, or maybe uh, putting a check uh, for amending the basic uh, structure of the constitution so uh, this uh, democracy and secularism will not reduce inequality it will not alleviate poverty 
but they are needed democracy and secularism are needed for alleviating poverty and bringing equality they are not they are the essential condition but they are not simply sufficient many more things are needed mainly uh, the structural changes a, a redistribution in the society uh, is needed to see that uh, everybody enjoys the right and privileges guaranteed by the constitution we are successful in a in a great degree uh, because of the constitution uh, but there are you know we have miles to go in attaining the the true spirits the true spirit of the constitution the principles and values uh, you know laid down by the constitution uh, and in the last paragraph professor uh, gobinath revindran exhorts us to be vigilant against any attempt to alter the basic structure as well as the directive principles or the idea of welfare state of the constitution be it in the name of religion nationalism economic efficiency whatever because as the responsible citizens of uh, the, this democratic country it's our responsibility to see that the purity of the constitution the spirit of the constitution is upheld uh, because uh, the spirit of the constitution should reign supreme in a democratic country at any cost i hope uh, you were able to gather a fairly good idea about the lesson let's now move on to a discussion of the short answer type questions and the answers thank you question number 1 in what respect is indian constitution unlike constitutions of other countries answer the indian constitution is unlike the constitutions of other nations in many respects some of its distinguishing features are a it was drafted over a period of nearly 3 years by a constituent assembly of elected representatives from provincial legislatures princely states and chief commissioner territories b it is the longest written constitution in the world running into about 145000 words c it invokes the people of india as the source of the constitution unmediated by any god or religion question number 2 is indian constitution a document that should not be amended at all what should be the ground for amendments answer no the indian constitution is a document that has provisions for amendment though through special procedures which are more difficult than normal legislative processes normally the grounds for constitutional amendment are changes or intended changes in the socio economic political factors technological revolutions and other factors that could not be anticipated at the time of drafting the constitution now the third question which amendment of the last century was the most controversial one what was the context of the amendment answer the most controversial amendment of the last century was the 42nd amendment made in 1976 this was found, found to curtail the democratic rights and also strip the supreme court of some powers it was generally understood as an undemocratic turn towards parliamentary sovereignty 
and the concentration of power on the prime minister the context of this amendment was the internal emergency declared in 1975 question number 4 what is the basic structure doctrine answer the basic structure doctrine is the doctrine that entitles the indian judiciary to review and strike down amendments to the constitution of india passed by the indian parliament if it is in conflict with or seeks to alter the basic structure of the constitution constitutional principles and values the honorable supreme court upheld this doctrine in the keshavananda bharati case next question what was the role of those who represented ancient regimes in the freedom struggle answer they were quickly defeated and they went on to collaborate with the colonial masters and did not make any significant contribution to the freedom struggle question number 6 which section of people according to the author actually led the freedom struggle of india and with what consequence answer according to the author the long drawn out struggle against the british in india was essentially led by a broad coalition of liberals and leftists who wanted an independent india that was democratic culturally plural and committed to the removal of age old social and economic inequalities that prevented large sections of our population from taking advantage of the possibilities afforded by an independent modern democratic indian state though political freedom became a reality the radical social redistribution of wealth and property has remained unmaterialized the seventh question how does the author describe indian freedom struggle highlighting the different episodes that form part of the grand design of the indian freedom struggle the author pres- presents the struggle as a mega movement that targeted not only political independence but also drastic socio economic changes like redistribution of wealth and property elimination of caste based discriminations etc question number 8 comment on the insertion of the words socialist and secular as part of the 42nd amendment the 42nd amendment is significant in the sense that it was the first time an amendment was made to the preamble of the constitution though the insertion of the words socialist and secular was welcomed the addition of certain articles and sections to the constitution as part of this was found to curtail the democratic rights and also strip the supreme court of some powers and hence became highly controversial and later repealed and now the ninth and the last question does the coming of the labor party help the cause of indian independence how yes the labor party government that came into power in britain in 1945 with clement attlee as a prime minister speeded up the independence of india the cabinet mission was sent to india in 1946 and in the same year the constituent assembly was formed in india in the next year 
Indian independence became a reality. Thank you for listening to this lecture and the question-answer discussion. Wish you all the best. Thank you.